Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Work Item Podcast. I'm very excited to have Mayuko Inoue uh, with us today. She is a YouTube creator, uh, software engineer extraordinaire. She's focused on iOS. Uh, she's worked at a couple of different tech companies, Intuit, Patron, and Netflix as an iOS engineer. Um, and we are very excited to have you on the show today. Uh, would you like to just kind of give us a high-level overview of like the content that you are focused on on your YouTube channel? Sure. Yeah. Well, hi. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my content. Uh, I, so I've been doing YouTube for about three years. And over the last three years, I've been making content broadly about tech, uh, career and life. Uh, and so that encompasses a lot of different things. Um, I typically don't do like coding tutorials, kind of coding educational content. A lot of is around like the life of a software engineer. What is it like to be a software engineer? What do you need to know to become a software engineer? What is my life like as a software engineer? So I cover so many different topics in that area, but kind of try to keep it fun and relatable and engaging throughout the process. And I think that's spot on with like our listeners. Um, we have so many people that listen to the podcast that are looking to break into the industry or don't know where to start. So again, your channel is just so rich with deep dives on that subject area. Um, awesome to have you here. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me again. You know, tell us a little bit about making the decision to go from working a full-time job into setting up your own thing, becoming a content creator, because I know that's also been on the minds of a lot of young people nowadays, like, oh, I'm gonna start a YouTube channel or I'm gonna become, uh, you know, a TikTok talk super, superstar. We talked with uh, Scott Hanselman about that. So yeah, like, how did you make that shift? Yeah, so um, I became like a full-time creator. So I quit my software engineering job last year, like about a year ago, exactly. Uh, and then I dove into full-time content creation at around March time in 2020. Um, but my channel has, existed for longer than that. So I started my channel in 2017. And so for a long time, for about two years, um, my YouTube channel was like a side thing. Uh, I was still working full time at Patreon, Netflix. Um, and so I did my YouTube stuff like on weekends and nights and stuff. Uh, but yeah, uh, there was a certain point where I was kind of like, do I want to keep being a software engineer? Like if I were to stay within the industry and kind of follow the path that others have tread before me, is that what I want to do? Like, is that kind of the energy that I want to put into my career? Is that the direction that I want to go? And I realized that it wasn't. Uh, I was a little bit like, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's like a path. And a lot of people have gone before me. And regardless of what I do, I will be breaking ground in some way, sure, because tech is still so new. Um, you don't find very many Japanese American women in tech. So <laughs> that's something. Uh, but yeah, th there was a certain point where I was just like, I think I want to try to do full-time content creation. And kind of the biggest factor for me was that I think the work of being a full-time content creator was really exciting. Um, it is, it was already really fulfilling to me to continue that work, uh, just cause I knew that I was making a really strong impact, um, on the people that I wanted to make videos for. Uh, and it was just fun. Uh, like the, being a content creator, like involves so many different skills that I never would have touched on or tried uh, as a software engineer. So um, it, it's, I think in some ways, like, um, I, don't, I don't know if it's necessarily more diverse set of skills, but it's like, I never would have uh, really thought about like, how do I get better at storytelling as a software engineer? How do I get better at um, becoming a business person and negotiating specific contracts. Maybe if I had gone to freelance, sure. Um, but yeah, there there are just a couple Even of things. Even the act of producing it, right? Exactly, like yeah. Making Filming. It, putting together the video, using lighting, your camera. Yeah, editing, all of that stuff. Like I started from scratch when I started my YouTube channel too, because I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. They didn't teach me this in school. Um, but it was all fun because in some ways it was like novel to me, so. It's a very interesting path and uh, definitely something that I feel like is so undervalued today in our industry, where like the storytelling, the art of actually telling a story. And I actually have a two-part question to this because it's a, it's a fascinating topic for me. Uh, you've made the transition to full-time content creator. I'm curious, taking just a little bit of a step back, how did you start your career as a software engineer? Because you have a very rich path um, uh, that you went through in different companies. And then as you made the transition to full-time content creator, I'm sure it's a very risky move 
for a lot of folks, it's a scary move. And I, I totally realize why, you know, there's a lot of financial burden. There is the burden of your network. How did you mitigate that? So I'll totally. set that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, my kind of a brief history of my career. Um, I went to University of California, San Diego um, for my bachelor's in computer science. I didn't know that I was going to study computer science when I went to college. I was like, I'm going to be an undeclared major that probably will go into science. And I just happened to find computer science because a friend was like, maybe you should try it. And I was like, sure. Uh, so that's kind of how I got into that. That was really just my entry into the field. It was super serendipitous, like had no idea that was going to happen graduated with my degree. And then um, I had a couple internships during uh, my student life. And then my first job out of college was working at Intuit, um, uh, working on the TurboTax iOS app. Um, I've been doing iOS development for like six years. That was like the whole of my career. And that was also serendipitous where like uh, the hiring manager, they had already given me the offer, but I didn't have a team. And they were like, what do you want to work on? And I was like, anything but security and DevOps. And then they're like, cool, iOS it is. Um, and so I kind of just kept going with that. Uh, after Intuit, um, I worked at Patreon for about two and a half years on their iOS app. And then I was at Netflix working on um, the Netflix iOS app as well. So that was my most recent role. Um, yeah, what you said about like it being super scary to make that career jump uh, like is totally true. It was downright terrifying, <laughs> actually. Um, I, I'm a child of immigrants and so, and, and child of Asian immigrants, I guess. And so kind of growing up, my whole goal was to just be like financially stable. Like I wanted to kind of take uh, the least amount of risks to um, be able to support myself after I graduated. And so that's kind of a big reason for why I studied computer science, went into software engineering, didn't choose uh, becoming a doctor or a lawyer because I suck at bio and lawyer stuff scares me a little bit. <laughs> so I was like, sure, let's be an engineer. Um, but yeah, it was really scary because it essentially like forced me to kind of get rid of and graduate from this way of thinking and th this value set that has served me for 20 something years. Um, and like, if I knew in college that I was one day just going to quit this software engineering job uh, that pays well, that's like not very risky to become a content creator, I'd be like, she is freaking wild. Like, why would she do that? Um, but yeah, I, I think because I, can't, I was coming from a place where it was terrifying. I did a lot of things to like kind of prove to myself that this would be okay. Um, a number of things, including like you mentioned the financial aspect of things. I did a lot of projections. This, maybe this is very techie, uh, but like I was like, okay, if I'm going to quit my job, become a full time content creator, uh, like I have certain requirements, right? Kind of just like in a product. I have requirements that I need to fulfill. I need to get paid a certain amount so that I can sustain on my living, um, need to make sure that I have health care, uh, like anything that I need to do to do life uh, was one big part of it. And so one of the things that I did was like literally just like a spreadsheet where I was like, well, based on my past history of like, I earned this much from AdSense, I earned this much from sponsorships over the last two years. Can I like reasonably, reasonably project that in this next chapter, I could make enough money uh, so that I could keep doing this. And so it was like kind of a gamble because I didn't have that much data. And when you have projections, you do want a good amount of data. <laughs> but uh, I was like, this is good enough. I mean, I'm sure like you don't really know until you try. I had never really like put the pedal to the metal and really had gone hard on content creation before. So there was definitely a risk there. But I was kind of willing to be like, yeah, I will work hard for this. I will do everything in my power to, to get this done. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of projections that happened. Um, and I think once I got to that point, and, and I, I should also mention that I'm married. And so like my husband's work uh, provided us health care. And so that was taken care of. So I was super, super grateful for that. Um, and then the other thing that I think was helpful in addition to projections was like, I wasn't, I think I got myself into a mindset where I wasn't like, this is going to be me forever. Like, I'm never going to go back to software engineering, because that how, like, how am I supposed to make that decision, right? It's like, like that it's hard to make a forever decision like that, especially in careers. Um, and so I learned this from another friend who had uh, like changed careers from being a software engineer to a content creator. And he taught me that um, when he started, 
he gave himself like a six month period where he was like, I'm going to try this for six months, like do full time for six months and then reassess if this is still working. And if it is, then maybe another six months, another three months, and then just kind of keep going like that. Um, that really helped me to be like, okay, yeah, like I have a period of time in which I can basically prove to myself that this is working or not. Uh, and like, it's not so long that I will have like driven myself into the ground and hit rock bottom. It's like a good test period. Um, so yeah, I, kind of six months came and went. And now I'm here a year later, still doing it. So <laughs> I think it kind of worked. Like it's, it's a lot of, um, it, I did what worked for me and I, and I, it took a lot of time in uh, kind of introspection as well as therapy every week to like really make sure that like I was going to be okay and that I felt okay with this decision. What was the stepping stone for you? You mentioned you did projections and you tested the water and you had the channel going before you really kicked it off. And I'm sure you were audience building well before that, right? On Twitter, um, using all your social avenues. But what was like the final point where you were like, I'm ready to go? Yeah, was it a particular viewer, you know, number? What what was it that kind of launched you? Yeah, well, I wish, like, this is, I, I guess, like, I wish it was a more, like, inspirational. Like, there was this one person who really inspired me. But frankly, it was a little bit like, I just didn't really want to stay another year at my job, to be honest. Like, I had a really nice job. I had incredible manager, um, teammates. Like, the product was really exciting and fun to work on. It was Netflix of all places. Uh, but like, even as part of my projection, I was like, if I stayed here for another year, like, what would I have? What do I want to accomplish here? And what are the skills that I'll have learned? Um, what are the things do I gain from being here? And of course, there was a lot to gain, obviously, um, being at a company like Netflix. But I think I realized that when I compared, like, what do I have to gain from being employed uh, as a sal with salary for another year versus being employed? by myself in trying something that I've always wanted to do, but I'm terrified to do, but maybe now is the right time. Like I just compared those two things and I was like, I don't know, this, this thing of like just taking a risk and doing it uh, is just so much more exciting for me. Like it made my like heart pump faster made the adrenaline rush. And I was like, I feel like this is what it's supposed to be. And to that extent, I actually wanted to ask, because to me, it's interesting. You, you mentioned kind of defining this runway. So you, six months after which you kind of check in. Um, and do you generally, because I think that's, that's a question that a lot of people would probably have is, do you keep this option in the back pocket of going back, right? Because yeah. there's, I think, two camps of people. There's folks that completely burn the bridges behind them. They say, this is it. Like you said, like you, you described it perfectly. We're like, this is my forever decision. I'm going down this route. There's no going back. And other folks say, well, I'll try this out. And if worst comes to worst, I'll go work back at Google or Apple or whatever company. How did you approach that? Yeah, um, I like I hate burning bridges because maybe it's just like I, I just like want people to like me and I'm a people pleaser. And I never really want to make anyone feel like I hate them kind of thing. So I think it comes kind of from a personality trait sort of thing, too. But yeah, I definitely like made sure to just like during my time at Netflix, like the whole year I was considering this, um, but I was not going to like compromise my quality of work uh, because I still wanted to also give Netflix like a fair try. Like, is this like what I do for a year, five years? Who knows? Like, I think I know that uh, about myself that I like my mind changes very quickly and I never know what's going to happen. So instead of like closing any door, I want to keep all my doors open for as long as possible because maybe right now my ego doesn't care about it. But like two years from now, my ego, like the world is going to look different. Um, like had I known that COVID was going to happen uh, when I made this decision, what I have, I have no clue. Right. And so, yeah, I think um, I, 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 I like to keep my doors open for as long as I possibly can, uh, even if it's even if I don't intend to walk through that door ever again, because you never know. COVID thrust us into this place, this weird spot where like if you were creating content and you were going to conferences and you were presenting, you would naturally bump into people. Right. Mm -hmm. But now you aren't doing in person and you're not in an office any longer. So how are you staying in touch with peers? Yeah. Other creators, other um, folks like that and building your network still. Totally. Well, so frankly, the interesting part about being a content creator is that 
um, like being a software engineer, it is really important to network with peers and other people who are going to kind of like help your career and stuff, because that's how you get opportunities, right? But being a content creator, the kind of dynamic shifts in that, like the thing that I really wanted to focus on in the last year was like getting to know my audience really well. Like if anything, that was kind of top of mind for me. So I spent a lot of energy doing that. I stream on Twitch Monday through Fridays. Um, I really focused on kind of community building just to get to know my audience better. Because I was like, there's a lot of you. And I don't really know if I'm making the right content for you. All. And I want to make sure that that's true. Because if I'm not making content that is serving you, then that actually affects my career. Um, so I think that was kind of, if anything, the most important thing. As far as like connecting with peers and stuff, I honestly haven't put in like that much effort for it. It kind of like has happened naturally, I guess. Um, there was like, there's connections that I've made in the past through in-person events. So I used to go to a conference called VidCon every single year that happened in Anaheim. Um, it's like the biggest YouTuber conference, which now I guess includes like TikTok and all of all of those kinds of media folks. But I met a lot of people through that. Um, in fact, we had like a Bay Area YouTubers group that we made and we went out for dinner and stuff sometimes and we all like traded secrets and um, shared challenges and whatnot. And so I had that group for a little bit to kind of lean on um, as well as like other friends who uh, like wanted to make YouTube content, I guess. Um, so yeah, I think that that was kind of it, it, it just kind of like, I didn't really force anything to happen. It just feels like it just sort of happened within the circles that I was already in. Um, I don't think there was anything strategic that I did. Maybe there was I'm trying to think I don't think there was I think it just kind of happened. The follow up here is like, how? How did you um, identify what your audience wanted? How like, in what ways were you doing that? You said that was like, kind of your focus. So yeah, I'm sure you had a process for that, right? Yeah, totally. So um, being a YouTube creator, especially is tricky because YouTube is not a great platform for community engagement. If anybody's ever looked at the YouTube comments in a video, <laughs> like not exactly the nicest place to be, nor is it pla a place where people like exchange discord handles or like, you know, it's not a place where friendships happen typically. Um, and so I think the previous two years of being on, on YouTube made me realize that where I was like, like YouTube in and of itself is not going to do it for me when it comes to community building and engagement. Um, a friend of mine who uh, used to run another popular like coding related YouTube channel, um, his name's MP MPJ and he runs a channel of Fun Fun Function. Um, he lives all the way out in Sweden, but we would connect every so often about stuff. Um, and he mentioned that like he started streaming on Twitch and it was one of the best things that he's done just because of the way that uh, you can engage through live stream is just so different. Um, and Twitch in and of itself is a gaming streaming platform. So it's not really necessarily made for people like me and MPJ, um, but the features itself are really helpful. Like Twitch is, I feel like every with every feature, you can tell that they're trying to have the viewers engage with folks through um, like being rewarded channel points for the longer that you watch or um, if you subscribe to them and you pay money, then you get like special stickers and abilities and stuff like that. So I tried Twitch at the recommendation of him because I was like, sure, why not? Uh, and then also I, I started seriously doing it in March also because I was like, I want coworkers and I miss being like around people and in an office. So um, I, I started this thing that I call Muko's Cafe where I stream Monday through Friday, um, alternating like mornings and afternoons where I like, um, literally just put a camera on myself and then put like a little Pomodoro timer widget that I wrote and then play like chill hop lo-fi music. And then people just come and hang out and code and study together. Um, and I didn't intend it to be like, I want to get to know you all so intimately, but it just kind of happened because uh, you get regulars and you start to get to know who they are and what they do and what their interests are. And we get to share inside jokes. And then all of a sudden I made a discord server um, and, uh, and now like the two of them I met are now like moderators who I consider my friends. And like, sometimes we've had like video chats with, um, kind of the core community and whatnot. So it's become this thing where I'm like, I know the people who watch my videos now, um, pretty well. Um, and, and then like at the end of last year too, I was like, okay, but there's more people out there than who watch my Twitch stream. So I put out like a, a survey where I was like, can you tell me about who you are? Like, do you study computer science? Like. It was, again, it kind of felt like user research survey a little bit. Like I bring a lot of these lessons that I learned by working as a product engineer. 
to my business. And so, yeah, when you want to get to know who's using or watching your stuff, um, qualitative research <laughs> has been really useful. You've done so much of essentially kind of crossing all the roles. So product manager, designer, mm -hmm. data scientist, engineer, yep. content creator. Uh, to that extent, I actually was uh, curious, you know, you mentioned Twitch. Mm -hmm. Twitch is uh, a live stream platform. Do you feel like there is that inherent pressure? Because when you record things like we record today, mm -hmm. it's very easy to, you know, screw up and then be like, oh, well, never mind. We'll edit this out. Sorry. Uh, and when you're live, you're live. Folks mm -hmm. see you. Folks see what you do. Folks see, you know, how you react to things. Folks can kind of sense your reaction to things. How do you mitigate that, right? Like, is that terrifying? It was at the beginning, yeah. I was like, they watching my every move. So, like, I got to make sure not to do anything super weird that I usually edit out. Like a um, fish in a fish tank, right? That's how I always thought. It's like, if I start just streaming myself designing, you know, it's just like they're watch, they're eyeballing me. Totally, yeah. Um, I So, I think, like, at the very beginning, just in general, like being in a live stream was hard um, because of, of just the fact that I was just like, I don't know what to do with my hands. Like my posture is always terrible. Um, my desk is kind of messy. But over time, I think I just kind of got used to it because not that many people were commenting about it. And if they were, I was just like, I don't care. Like this, this is who I am in my most like raw state. Um, and so and especially because I was doing co-working shoes or I wasn't showing myself coding. Uh, it took a little bit of the pressure off because it was literally just like, if you were to sit next to me and stare at me the whole time, this is also what you would get. <laughs> um, and then I also think over time, I realized the value of something like that, where like being in a live stream format, it allows people to see an incredibly raw version of yourself that's unedited, that has all the ums and uhs, um, where I need to take hydration breaks and bio breaks. Like, it's just like, I'm just such a human being that you're just like getting to see and stuff. And so... Um, I, I think I've gotten really comfortable with that more and more. Like a week ago, I actually painted my room on stream because I was like, I need to do this, but I also want there to still be a place for people to come and study and listen to music together. Uh, so I'm just going to point the camera at the wall and paint. And so it's like, it gives this really like authentic glimpse into my life, I think. And that's something that I think is really important to my content and my audience and my brand of giving a very real depiction of my life. Um, Cause it's, I'm just me, like I'm just me living my life and it just happens to be on the internet. Um, but the coding part of it, like coding on live streams definitely can be scary. Like Court, you said the whole like designing uh, on stream can be terrifying stuff and coding on stream for me is still terrifying, especially because it's like in tech, it feels like everyone has something to say about how you code. Uh, it can be just like it it really stirs the imposter syndrome a lot um and so the the way that i've just been dealing with it is like setting really clear rules where i'm like do not backseat code if you do i will time you out uh because i'm not doing this to like i think i i the reason why i do coding streams is not to teach nor is it to be like this is the golden standard of code it's just to be like i don't know maybe you kind of like want to see me code and that's it like zero judgments on how i code like everyone codes a different way and that's fine um so yeah i think after i realized what my intentions were i was able to set boundaries which is like this is what you can do and cannot do uh to interact with me and that's been really helpful so the boundaries are critical yep uh we had scott hanselman on last week that was actually kind of hitting on that same thing as a content creator you know you can move into this space where you're chasing too much and you're pushing too hard and you might hit burnout. Um, yeah. You mentioned boundaries. Is there anything else you're doing to kind of fight that and prevent yourself from just feeling like you're on a, um, you know, a hamster and a hamster ball, right? Like I'm just creating content all the time and chasing some vanity number. Totally. Yeah. It's tough because it's like content creators, like not that common of a job, especially as like a full-time thing. And also, especially a content creator who makes videos about tech and code and career and lifestyle stuff. So like, I don't really have like a, like a handbook or like uh, people who I can really like model my stuff after, um, even for stuff like work life balance. And so for me, the way that I've been managing burnout really is to just like do a lot of self reflection. Um, like when I was 
uh, first getting into content creation, I didn't know what my limits were. I was like, can I make a video a week? Can I make two videos a week? Or should I, should I stick to one every two weeks? Like I didn't even know what that was. So it required some experimentation. Again, something that I like borrowed from the tech world of just like experiment and see how things go and assess uh, how it went and make small iterative changes. Um, and I think I quickly realized two videos a week is a little tough for me just by myself. Uh, one is a little bit more doable. And then creatively speaking, um, I have a great therapist, honestly, who I talk to about like when I'm stuck in a creative rut and I feel like I'm not doing enough or um, I feel like I'm on my way down or I've peaked or something, having someone to kind of check me and be like, but is that right? Like, like creative journeys are so ebb and flow and so up and down that like, can you judge yourself about that kind of stuff? Um, and, and I think also like l taking lessons that I learned about work-life balance from working in tech, because the tech industry is also really infamous for burnout too, right? So I know that like, I hate working out of like regular work hours usually. So like, I've also kind of set that for myself. I'm just like, yeah, generally I will work between nine to five and then have the evenings to myself. Um, yes, yeah, sometimes I'll, I'll work on weekends. Yes, yeah, sometimes I'll work nights because, you know, I want to or like that. It just calls for that. And that's OK. But so long as I feel like I, I can still attend to all of my other life needs, I'll be OK. So it's a lot of it's a lot of checking in with myself. Strong boundaries. Um, therapy has been really helpful. You said that like that allows you to work through your thoughts. And obviously, when you're creating content, you're getting feedback from the world. All the time, and there might yeah. be things that people are saying that are not nice. I don't know if you ran into that, but I know that like you could just post something and it could just blow up and you not in unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. Has that happened to you? Not in a negative way or positive? Like which way has it gone for you? Yeah. Um, unexpectedly it, like, wow. Totally. It's gone both ways many times. Uh, I think most um, kind of pointedly was my very first video because my very first video, A Day in the Life of a Software Engineer, was literally the first video that I ever posted on YouTube. Uh, and it went viral, and now it has like almost 5 million views or something like that. Um, so I learned very quickly just like like how it felt to have all of a sudden all these eyes on you when you don't even know what you're doing, I guess. Uh, so like I think at the beginning, it was really difficult because I was like, all these people are just seeing me live my life, and they're picking at all these different things. In the video itself, I don't show myself coding for that long because when I was editing it, I was like, people don't want to watch me sit at a desk for five minutes straight. That's boring. That's like not interesting YouTube content, in my opinion. Um, but then people picked holes on it because they were like, wow, you only like coded for like two minutes. And I was like, yeah, but like editing, you, know, you edit people, come on. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely took some time to work through. And there was definitely both positive and negative on that video. I think the negative has been made a bigger impression on me because it's just like people really have judgments about everything. Um, I've made a lot of other videos too that talk about um, like some personal things of mine, like how I've lived with anxiety or just uh, like when I left my job, um, just opening up about like kind of some life events and stuff. And those oftentimes receive really good feedback of people who Kind of have felt um, similar ways that I have, or who experienced similar things, um, who shared their stories, um, and and I, I think that is probably easily one of my most favorite parts of the job of being able to connect with people who I wouldn't have able have been able to connect with ever, uh, and learning who they are. But the negative side definitely is um, also a part of the job, and it requires a little bit of thick skin. But I think. All of us are on the internet nowadays and all of us are being exposed to like someone else's judgments. And I think I realized that like, yes, people will always judge me for what I do and what I don't do. But at the end of the day, I'm the one who places value on the words that I want to. So if I place value on the words that internet trolls are saying, then I'm giving them more power than they deserve. Uh, Cause I know who I am. Like I know that I didn't code for two minutes that day. I know I coded for much more than that. And so as long as I know my own truth, uh, then like the words that are meant to attack me really don't hurt that much. So you take an interesting approach to this. You take this very genuine, raw, here's my life, here's how I do things, which is the opposite of what a lot of 
creators do today where they take this almost like a crafted image of like, I have this perfect setup for everything. My life is so figured out. It's so structured. And instead you were talking about, you know, I will just point the camera at me painting the room. Yeah. <laughs> um, what led you to take this approach that is, again, not, not a typical approach in the current content creator landscape? Yeah. I think there's two things here. One, I, I, I'm probably going to bring this up over and over again, but like my tech background, uh, you know, like when you're making products and stuff, you're not trying to make the pixel perfect, most feature complete thing. You're trying to push out an MVP first to see if this is like even what people want and if it works. Um, like being an iOS developer, I worked really closely with product managers and designers and realized that just because you put in more effort doesn't mean that it work so that it's the right thing. Sometimes it's like, actually most of the time it's okay to be very scrappy to like test out different things first before you really kind of hone in on the detail and all of that kind of stuff. At least um, from kind of the the perspective that, that I've um, crafted about product development. There's other people who are out there who are like, let's, you know, spend 120% of my effort on making it super perfect. And I super admire those people. Um, but I, 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 I think the experiences that I've had of like being scrappy and iterating from there works for me. Um, so I think I lean a lot on that. of just like, you know, I don't know what I, I really don't know what I'm doing most of the time. And I don't know how people are going to perceive it. So let's just try it and see what happens. Um, and so, yeah, my tech background is definitely a part of that. Uh, the second part of it is um, so through going to events like VidCon, um, I hear, I, I heard early on a lot about from other creators about their best practices. And primarily the one that really stuck with me was from a creator named Hank Green. He's part of um, Hank and John Green. He makes content with his brother. He's founded SciShow Crash Course. Uh, he wrote books. He's just like internet extraordinaire guy. Uh, he's incredible. And I, I really admire him for his work. Um, and I think it was a video or something. Uh, where he talks about like, it's basically the 80 20 rule, uh, that we all use in tech, but it's basically like, you know, only work to something until it's 80% of the way done because that last 20% is not going to make that big of a difference. Um, cause videos is also something that you can spend so much time on and never publish. Cause you can just go down to a rabbit hole of like, oh, but it'd be cool to have this animation here uh, and this like sound effect and these transitions and like all of that kind of stuff. Um, and there are creators who really are good at that. Like they're incredible at what they do. But I know that like, I didn't go to film school. Like I didn't do Photoshop as a hobby. Like I'm, that's not my strength. Uh, my strength is being able to talk about tech in a friendly, approachable, relatable way. And so realizing that I'm like, yeah, you know, like I really should only spend 80% effort because the last 20% is probably going to make my content worse, if anything, because I don't, I still don't know like how to do a lot of that stuff. Um, and so after I heard that from Hank Green, I actually heard it from quite a lot of other creators too, about just like bringing it to a point where you're like, okay, this is like good, not, you know, life changing, but it's, it's good. Like this is fine as it is. Um, and so, yeah, I think those two things together combined has helped me to just kind of be like, it's better to do things than to dwell and uh, like detail things, at least in my kind of business operation. So, yeah. How important has uh, community building been for your success? Uh, you mentioned a little bit like uh, Discord, which allows you to kind of probably organize and coalesce like the people who are following you. You mentioned YouTube is not the greatest place to communicate and like share ideas and that type of thing. So how are you fostering your community? How are you um, staying in touch with the people that are your biggest fans? Yeah, yeah. I really think the Twitch and Discord combo has been helping a lot. Um, I guess the question of like, how has it contributed to my success is a tough one to answer because success, like every in any definition is hard to define most often people define success in content creation in youtube as like how many subscribers do you have how many views do you have on your videos um which you know is one metric of it but i think the other side of it is like uh especially because of the content that i make like how much am i helping people to feel like they can make it into the tech industry that um they're addressing imposter syndrome that they feel like they're they can make it here uh, basically. And I think that qualitative part of success has been really, um, ha has been kind of what Twitch and Discord have allowed me to achieve because 
like it's there's nothing quite like just like making friends with some random person who you don't know who maybe is also like a college student who is like also suffering from uh the wraths of like the theory of computation uh class and trying to figure out regular expressions and whatnot and and then like also learning about like someone who you you know, on Discord has been saying that they've been trying to get a job for three, four months, and then they finally got a job. So it's like stuff like that, that really, I think, fosters that kind of connection. And I think the way that I've created those um, communities also helps a lot, too. Like, I've been really intentional about making them like warm, kind, wholesome, like places uh, to exist. Because I don't, like, I don't know where to go for some of that sometimes on my own, especially in tech. Um, especially because, you know, in tech, people go to teamblind.com and it's just like, it makes you just question everything all the time. <laughs> uh, and I wanted a place where people can be authentic and like share both their wins and their losses and get to know each other respectfully, of course, um, uh, with their own set of boundaries. Uh, and I, I think the those two places have really been helping with that. And it's been helping me too, because it's been really fulfilling to get to know specific people because it's one thing to see like, oh my gosh, like a hundred thousand people watch my videos, which yes, it's like, that's a hell of a lot of people, but uh, getting to know the stories behind like who they are um, and what kind of life they lead. Cause e each of them are individually unique and have their own struggles and their own goals and stuff. And somehow they found it to my video. And seeing how I can be a part of their journey is just like, that stuff is just like, there's no like metric uh, or number that can really quantify how how amazing that is and how, how good that feels and how much meaning it brings to my life and my work. It's a fascinating also transition to the fact that you, you mentioned blind. And to me, <laughs> it always comes up with, uh, I have a friend whose uh, mom is a therapist mm -hmm. and she was talking about how all these folks from company X, I will leave the company unnamed, would come in to these therapy sessions and talk about how terrible things are, how absolutely nuts everything <laughs> is. But then you have just the sample of folks that are very, very unhappy. And then a lot of them might not be. So it, it's always extrapolating, you know, the, some of the folks, not everyone, but some of the folks that are very vocal can be very pushy about specific ideas. And it's interesting that, you know, you're handling that at scale because you do have more than 300,000 subscribers. This is a massive amount of folks that probably have their own, like, oh, I like this content, I don't like this content. And to that, you know, what I want to zero in is something that I think is very, very important and that you mentioned that you're focusing more on these meaningful metrics versus what we tend to refer to as the vanity metrics, right? Like mm -hmm. you talk about the qualitative side, how many folks actually uh, find your content useful and impactful. And you recently started a newsletter. Well, I don't want to say recently. It was last year. Uh, <laughs> was that part of this effort of kind of connecting more with the audience? Like, tell us more about the, your newsletter. 100%. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, the newsletter thing was interesting because uh, I feel like I've heard every content creator uh, and their relative, like, be like, you should make a newsletter because you're a content creator. And I was like, but I don't know what I would write about. Like, and most newsletters that I do subscribe to are about promoting your own content or something. And it's, it's like updates, right? Um, and I was like, I don't know that that would add, I, it would help my business, but does it actually add value, I guess? Like, is this something that I would want to read all the time? Like, yeah, there are creators that I stand hard, but like, I don't always open their newsletters if they're kind of like that, right? Um, and so, yeah, the newsletter part was another, again, like like you said, kind of a qualitative experiment where I was like, let's, like, I think I finally had the idea of, there is a place um, in my mind of lots of thoughts about content creation, about the tech industry, about software engineering that don't get expressed in videos because videos for me take a while to, figure out how I want to say things. Because once you put up a video, it's kind of there forever until unless you take it down. Uh, and so it, it takes me a while to just be like, I don't really know what I'm trying to say, but there's like a point and like, how do I make it in a way that like people actually click and watch it and find it useful and it's not just ranting. So newsletter is kind of where I did that. Because I knew that the people who subscribe to my newsletter are going to be like the top one to 5% most engaged people. Cause why would, why else would you like, if you don't like my stuff, you probably don't care about my, my newsletter. 
Um, so yeah, my newsletter, I decided to just be like, it's just like, like, you know, if I were to write a letter to somebody who's also in tech and I just kind of wanted to like air certain thoughts that I've had, um, where would I do them? Uh, I didn't necessarily think that I need to like have answers to any of these things, but I just wanted to say it just to say it. Uh, so like every newsletter I talk about like tech related content, non tech related content. And then there's still an updates for me section that's pretty small. Um, but the first newsletter I talked about like ethics and tech because I just happened to watch a really inspiring TED talk where I was just like, this is just so interesting. And it's taking up space in my brain. And I think about it all the time. But do I have thoughts or a video? Not really. Let's just put it onto a newsletter. So that, like, you know, it's just like there, you know, people can see what I'm thinking about uh, and kind of like what goes on behind the scenes. So yeah, it, it was another like qualitative thing, which I think has gone pretty well. I'm not super consistent at it because it takes a lot of time to write and I'm not <laughs> a writer, but, but yeah. How are you staying um, really deeply connected to the craft? So this is talked about a lot in tech where it's like, I want to stay an IC. I want to be an individual individual contributor, right, on the team. And I want to stay close to, I want to work with iOS. And I want to do that every day. I don't want to move into a management position or whatever and get away from that. As a content creator, you could potentially shift away from the act of actually doing the thing and more talk, just talking about it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you're doing a daily stream. Mm -hmm. Where do you, do you have a, um, you know, monthly schedule for like, here's what I want to try to build this month or what does that look like? Like you're planning for content. Yeah. It's uh incredibly, I guess as, as it pertains to coding, it's very ebb and flow. Um, so yeah, for coding stuff, it's such like a, it's honestly a challenge that I'm facing. I'm just like, like staying relevant in coding and technology, I guess. And oftentimes it just comes down to like, but okay, why is it important? Like in the industry, we often talk about it's important to stay relevant, even if you become a manager to keep coding because that's how you stay employable, blah, blah, blah. Um, but as a content creator, it's like those rules don't really apply. And then I also challenge, I'm just like, but is it though? Like, yes, it's it's good to stay afloat on the patterns that are emerging, but do you really need to code all the time if you, you know, have a pretty good grasp on it? Like I haven't professionally coded for a company in a year, but I feel pretty confident that I can get back up to speed and like uh, contribute meaningfully as an iOS engineer again if I wanted to. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a lot of just like, is it important? And, or is it just my imposter syndrome? Because if I'm talking about technology in my content, Maybe I should code because that gives me street cred. But why is street cred important? Like, why? Like, like should I value that because other people value it? If like, if I don't value it, then, like, it's there's so many, there's a lot of tension there for me because I'm just like I don't really know. Right, um, and, and what's the point of your channel too? Right. Yeah. Like, what's the value my channel is providing? It's not necessarily being the most bleeding edge iOS exactly. developer, right? Yeah, definitely. Like, I've never made content about coding. Like, I don't, I don't really do that. And that's not me. And that's not why people watch my stuff. So the only thing that it would really benefit um, is is that, yeah, maybe it would give me some street cred and people would be like, oh, she actually codes. But it's like, but I have already actually coded. So like, shouldn't that be kind of enough? <laughs> um, but I do still like, I still enjoy coding. I think like being away from uh, being a, like a salaried software engineer um, has helped me to realize that like, yeah, you know, coding has its frustrations, but at the end of the day, I like coding because I like making stuff. And I realized that from making videos, I recently got into like woodworking and I was like, this is really fun. Like, why is this fun? Oh, cause I'm making something that didn't exist before. And I'm seeing a lot of parallels. I'm just like, oh, no wonder I wanted software engineering. Cause like building stuff is fun. Um, so yeah, sometimes I code like late at the end or no, I guess like at certain points during last year, I worked on like a kind of side app where I was just like, let's just learn how this new iOS thing called SwiftUI works. Let's just explore it just for fun. Um, and so right now I'm kind of approaching it in the sense of just like, do it when you, if you want to, but like, I don't want to code because I feel like I should be or that I have to be like those, that state of mind. My therapist is always like, should you be doing it? Or then do you have to do it? Uh, like, is that actually true or not? Like, you know, do things because you want to do them. Like, you're in a place where you can do that. So, yeah, as far as the coding thing um, goes, uh, kind of that's how I've been dealing with it. For content creation, how to keep up with my craft, I just, like, watch a lot of YouTube, honestly. <laughs> watch a lot of videos. I'm curious, uh, and I want to earmark the woodworking part because that is something that, again, 
very, very uncommon. Uh, <laughs> but before we get there, what are your sources of inspiration for new content? And do you ever feel like, because you're producing content on such a regular cadence, uh, do you feel like you're running out of ideas where it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I don't know what to talk about today? Yeah, all the time. In fact, I'm like in that right now, actually. I'm a little, a little bit like, I don't know what to make. Like I have some general ideas. What do I even make next? Um, yeah, sources of inspiration come from everywhere, I guess. Like I just, I try to let it, so there are some active things that I do to like make the inspiration happen. So I try to find like other YouTube channels that make comparable um, content to me, whether that be other tech channels, or other like career related channels that might have something to do with medicine or legal stuff or something else, right? Um, and I, I sometimes I peruse into them. Sometimes it's hard to because I can't help but compare my channel and stuff to them. But when I'm in the right mindset, I kind of venture in and be like, what's everyone else talking about? Oh, you're talking about desk setups? Okay, I'll make a desk setup video because I think my desk setup is pretty cool. Um, so sometimes it comes from that. Uh, other times I just like, I do think about tech still a lot of just like, like why are certain things the way that they are? Um, like, why is the gender gap still so big? Why are there all these students who are trying to get into tech, but they're having such a hard time finding jobs? Um, why are, uh, why don't companies hire shit out of boot camps? And if there are, where are they? Like, I just have all these questions, I think, from my experience of being a software engineer that have just been like brewing in my mind and they just take up space. So sometimes inspiration comes from that. Um, other times it comes from the kinds of content that I just like watching. Currently, I'm really into like um, slow living, like lifestyle content uh, from Japan. Cause that, like, it's just, it feels like I'm watching a Ghibli movie, but like, I'm actually just like in someone's living room and it's really calming. Um, or like this other niche that I found myself in of like uh, ASMR cooking, uh, stop motion cooking videos, but with Lego bricks instead of food. And it's just like, this has nothing to do with my content, but it's like, it's just so cool. Cause it does inspire me to be like, you know, if I actually planned my shots and stuff, it could result in something very cool. Um, and, and other creators that I really admire too, always, always inspire me. So it comes from a lot of places. I like that you're talking about your other interests because one of the things we like to dive into is like, what do you normally not talk about, right? When you're interviewed. <laughs> and um, that brings me back to the woodworking um, and like being a builder myself, um, I actually built my office. Like I love it. I love doing things with my hands. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm on a computer all the time staring at a screen. Like I want to get away from this space as much as possible. And so like woodworking for you sounds like the same type of thing. Um, and I don't know if you've gotten into Japanese joint, like wood joinery, oh. but like it's fascinating. Oh my gosh. Like, I literally just started watching videos of that like two days ago and I can't stop watching it. Yeah. It, it becomes addicting. You're watching it and you're like, how are they making these joints? And then you think thousands of years ago they were doing this. But yeah. And they still like the videos are still doing it by hand. And I'm like, but how do you get that right angle? Like how? And then yeah. you think like, imagine doing this with just, you know, rough tools. You don't have yeah. like electric saws or hand saws or anything. Yeah. Totally. It's so fascinating. And I think part of it is because it's like you can, it, this whole craft has existed for thousands of years. Um, whereas, you know, like tech content, like YouTube didn't exist like even 20 years ago. Uh, and so I think it's fascinating to be into something that has existed for a long time because it's just like, it feels very human. I feel like I'm connected where I'm just like, oh yeah, like this is a thing that has been like a necessity for this long. And there's been thousands of years of, of really just technology being built up of people like learning how to do this stuff and learning from each other. And because of the age of the internet, we get to learn about all these different things from different parts of the world. So yeah, it, it's so fun. It's really cool to hear that you're a builder too. I'm like, I'm still learning a lot. I'm still so new at it, but it, it's been really fun. What are your uh, challenges right now that you're working on or projects that you're working on in yeah. the woodworking realm? Literally, <laughs> literally an hour before this uh, recording, actually, I was like, I was using my miter saw because I was, I was like in the shop doing stuff. Um, I was, I'm making an outdoor like table, outdoor dining set right now. Um, we just moved to our house in June and the, like we have, I have a backyard for the first time ever. And I live in San Diego, so I'm just like indoor, outdoor living all the time. 
Uh, so I really wanted to make like an outdoor dining set. So I was making the benches for them um, earlier and I found plans. And I, it's so interesting because I'm just like, this is also very technical. Uh, we're like measuring in right angles and like using the right tools. Uh, and like, you still have to be a little bit of a creative problem solver because of the certain kinds of wood that you're using. Um, like, how are you supposed to use it? Is software or is it hardwood? Like all these things that I'm just like, there's so many parallels to every, like to content creation and software engineering. Um, like if I don't know how to do stuff, I just look it up on the internet and watch a YouTube video, which is similar to how I like look up stuff on Stack Overflow basically. So yeah. With all these things, how do you manage to have a healthy balance between life and work? Because I feel like at some point, right, I know the cliche thing when people say, you know, if you like what you do, you never work an hour in your life, which is fine. But I'm sure you still want to have time to disconnect or yeah. time where you just kind of recharge, refresh. What's your approach to that? 100%. Yeah. The whole, the whole like, uh, if you love what you do, you won't work a day in your life thing. So I think that's true for some people. For me, I'm just like, no, I will. Sometimes our work sucks and I hate it. Like, <laughs> like there, there are those ups and downs, you know, it's not always beautiful and rosy and easy. Sometimes it's really freaking hard. And I'm like, why did I get myself into this? But yeah, the balance I think is really important. Um, I think this last year, especially as I've been thinking a lot more about my mental health and monitoring it, I'm no, I'm more in tune with like what my body needs, I guess. So yeah, like it sounds like I'm doing a lot, but like this is all the stuff that I've literally been spending days, weeks, and months on for the last year. Um, and so in reality, like my day's not that packed. Uh, and I like, you know, I, I make sure to sleep at least eight hours a day because I, I'm not one of those people that can function on five to six hours. Um, I eat very well. I like take naps when I need to. I like potato and watch TV on the couch for like four hours when I feel like I want to. Um, but I think it's like, I have all these like, things that I'm just so interested in. Uh, and I think that helps me to just like get up and actually do these things. But like, you know, even with woodworking, after a while, your back starts hurting. Uh, you just feel very sweaty and there's sawdust all over you. And you're just like, okay, I need a break. And then you just like go and sip some water and stuff. So I think it's like, I've been, I'm very, I'm learning to become very in tune with my body and giving it what it needs and wants. Uh, and I think that's been helping a lot. I think I've ignored it a lot in the past, um, but like just something as easy as just like, just take a five minute break and just like not look at a screen for a little bit or like go play with my dogs uh, has helped me to achieve that balance a lot. And and I don't know, like sometimes, it, it, sometimes life necessitates you to like push really hard and kind of um, not take care of yourself. And there are those times obviously, but I, I really think it's all about just like, achieving a good balance that feels right for you. And that looks different for everybody. I think it's interesting because this has so many parallels with literally the previous episode that we recorded with uh, our friend Scott Hanselman, where we talked about intentionality. Mm -hmm. You're being intentional about things. And we realize that sometimes there are sacrifices. Like you said, there is the need to, you know, have a longer night because you need to finish a project for tomorrow, but it's not constant. And it's interesting yeah. that you also are alluding to kind of the opposite of hustle culture. Because <laughs> There's so much of it where folks like if you're not working 24 seven, you're going to lose out on your career prospects. You're going to lose out on success and you manage to accomplish. And I want to say, you know, again, success like you very astutely observed is that it's different for each person. Mm -hmm. Success for me might be different from success for you or for Courtney. And how did you get to a point where you kind of I don't want to say like discarded, but said things like, you know, hustle culture, all this stuff. It's not for me. I want to be mindful about what I do. I want to be careful about how I structure my day, what I think about, what I work on. What was that? What, what was your take on that? Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, it's like so easy to prescribe to hustle culture because that's all you hear about. And that's how it's just like, oh, I guess we all live in 2021 now. I guess that's what we're supposed to do. Um, but I think there was a time where I did prescribe to it and I really tried to push hard. And I was like, well, there's this person who at my work who like is doing stuff all the time and maybe I should be more like her. And I think I tried that. And then I was just like, I, I don't like it. Like I, I, I had like several panic attacks in the last couple of years. And I was just like, I think, I think the panic attacks are because I'm not actually listening to what I want and my body is forcing me to listen. So 
yeah, I think mental health has like kind of forced me to slow down, um, which, you know, some people are like, yeah, it's okay. I can deal with it. It's fine. But I'm like, I'm, I feel very sensitive to that kind of response in my body. So I'm just like, okay, yeah, I hear you. Like, let's, let's slow the heck down. Um, but I think the other thing, which really is, I think has been kind of a theme in this whole chat of about like, met, like for me, the metrics, the qual quantitative stuff, yes, is like one way to define success. It's one way um, that people define their happiness. It's one way to like structure your life, but the qualitative, like, but how does it feel? Um, like the stuff that is priceless that you can't put a number on, that stuff to me is equally or if not more important. And I think I keep being reminded of that through my work, like from being a software engineer. Yes, like we're always talking about, are we you know, hitting um, our metrics? Are we growing quickly enough? Are people using this feature enough? Um, and then as a content creator, I'm like, did enough people watch my videos? Did enough people click through? Is the click through rate high enough? But it's like, yeah, okay, that's fine. But like, if I were just to look at that, I, I don't know that I could find true, like a, a true sense of like happiness, fulfillment, belonging. Uh, but if I think about like, oh, all the things that I learned from working on this thing um, and, and building it as a software engineer or like learning about a user who had this experience with the feature or the people and relationships that I was able to build uh, by working on a product, um, as well as just like the comments and individual stories that I get from the videos that I make, like that stuff to me really matters. So I think that also applies to my life where it's like, yes, I could optimize the heck out of my life and count every hour and like have these goals and OKRs and percentages and all of that. But at the end of the day, like I will, I think I will always be happier if I'm just like, did I eat something good today? Or like, do I feel rested? Like, am I having fun in life? Like, did I get to spend time with the people that I love? Um, and I think that contrast of just like, if I focus on some of those things and actually prioritize it, sure, it's maybe a little bit counterculture, but like, I know that works for me and that helps me. So yeah, I, I think that's been like a big um, theme in my life <laughs> over the last couple of years. So as we're kind of wrapping things up here, if people wanted to learn more about you and um, just kind of see what you're about, uh, what would be your top video you recommend um, of yours? Like what's your yeah. favorite video that you did and you feel like is like, man, I was going to give somebody one video. Can I, can I look? <laughs> so like, yeah go for it go for it okay there's a lot because i have a lot of videos where i'm just like that is a freaking good video but if they were to watch like one video that i i really was proud of uh let's see okay hold on i'm just i'm just looking through i'm just looking through okay i think Oh man. Okay. I'm going to recommend a couple just, just cause I think it tells Go the whole story it, yeah. a little bit. Okay. So I think, um, a video that I did recently was about imposter syndrome, uh, about like what it is, how to deal with it. I think I recommend that one because these are the things that I've learned over the last six, seven years of being an engineer, um, that I wish I had, that I wish like a mentor or someone had told me early on, I guess. Uh, so I, I, I know like that video to me is almost like, like I'm telling my my former self, like this is like this is what I've learned, and uh, and, I, and I think that video has a lot of power in just like at least getting you used to like thinking about your own mental state and uh, like realizing that you're totally valid as a human being, I guess, which is not a message that you hear all all the time, especially in tech. Um, I recommend that one. I'm really proud of all of my vlogs, I guess. Man, I'm just is it okay if I just say like all. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. We'll link to the channel. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I just talk about so many things. That's kind of like the thing about my channel. I talk about lots of different things. Um, like there's a lot of these like former, like letter to my former self. I wish I had known this earlier on career related videos. I also like cook in my videos because I'm like, that's still a part of me. A lot of people ask me about my hair and hair care. So I was like, here, here's my hair. Uh, as well as like my experience going through a four year degree for computer science. I make a lot of videos about my dogs. Like it's kind of just lots of different things. So, um, if you're into any of that, then you can follow me at Hell of a Eagle on YouTube. 
Wonderful. And speaking of which, as again, we're wrapping up, where can people find you? So what are the places you prefer people to go to learn more about your work, follow your work and learn more as you learn as well? Yeah, definitely youtube.com slash Helen Mayuko. That's kind of my main place. Um, if you want to come chill and hang out and like chat and stuff with myself and others in the community, then twitch.tv slash Helen Mayuko, uh, where I stream co-working sessions Monday through Friday. There's also a Discord community for that as well, where I'm like, I have Discord up all the time. Uh, and so I engage with folks there. And then also Instagram, because uh, I'm a content creator after all, <laughs> uh, where I'm also Hello Mayuko as well. Wonderful. Well, Mayuko, thank you so much for coming on our show. We learned a lot and it's been a very, very insightful chat. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. This has been really thank fun. You.